Hi, and welcome all. I'm Carol Basim, a Scientific Manager for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for the May installment of the CLSA webinar series for 2017. We will be welcoming Dr. Philip St. John from the University of Manitoba to talk about multiple morbidity in Canada. Before I further introduce our presenter, I just wanted to share a few reminders about today's presentation. The webinar will run for about one hour with an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. Participants will be muted, but questions or concerns can be posted at any time. If you have a question, you can enter it into the chat window at the bottom right of the WebEx window at any point during the session. These questions then will be moderated at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Be sure to select all participants from the drop down menu before you press the send button. Mobile users must select chat with everyone. Remember the questions will be visible to all attendees and this presentation is recorded and will be posted to the CLSA website in the future. I'd now like to welcome today's presenter. Dr. Philip St. John is an associate professor and head of geriatric medicine in the Department of Eternal Medicine at the University of Manitoba. He is an affiliate of the Center on Aging at the University of Manitoba and is the code lead investigator of the CLSA Manitoba site. His research interests include rural health and epidemiology of co cognitive impairment and depression. Now, thank you for joining us, Dr. St. John, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this is the first webinar I've done, so um, if I uh, get the technology right, it hopefully will go okay. Um, and if I say something uh, kooky, just uh, write something in the chat box. Um, so um, I would like to acknowledge um, some of the co-authors. Um, so Lindsay Torbiak is a medicine resident, Suzanne Tias in Waterloo, uh, Verena Menick here, uh, Bob Tate here in Winnipeg, uh, Lauren Griffith, um, and in particular Scott Nowicki, who is the analyst who did uh, most of these analyses. Um, so in terms of conflict of interest, um, first we did get a grant from the Centre on Aging, so I would like to thank uh, them for that. Um, and as well, I really don't have any conflicts of interest except, as we'll come back to it, I am in the, in the high income group, which is a bit of a conflict of interest. Um, so being a clinician, I thought we'd start with a, a case, and it's a, a true case that we had on our inpatient unit uh, actually a couple of years ago now. Um, she was 81. Um, she was living in the same house in the north end of Winnipeg for 40 years um, since she immigrated from the former, former uh, Yugoslav Republic. Um, and her daughter was living in the house immediately next door. Um, she was previously ADL independent, um, but IADL dependent. She had a past history of multimorbidities. So she had type 2 diabetes, hypertension, uh, macular degeneration, actually, and cataracts, osteoarthritis, ischemic heart disease, uh, congestive heart failure, chronic renal failure, uh, falls, uh, urinary incontinence. And she had cognitive issues noted by both her daughter um, and her son, uh, but had never had a formal cognitive assessment. Um, she was followed as an outpatient by a family doctor and eight specialists. So she came into one of the peripheral hospitals with an acute stroke. She had left-sided <laughs> weakness, slurred speech, and falls. Um, she, uh, she got TPA at that hos at the uh, at the major teaching hospital, so she was transferred to the major teaching hospital and then transferred back to the uh, peripheral hospital, and then after f four or five days, she was transferred uh, for rehab. <clears throat> uh, day two of rehab, she got worsening shortness of breath, and her baseline dose of Lasix uh, was increased, and the thinking at that time was that she was in, in heart failure. Um, and then she deteriorated over the next two days to the point that she was on 15 liters of oxygen, which is fairly substantial. And she was transferred to a third uh, acute care hospital in her stay, and she was diagnosed with bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a complication of pneumonia, and she was treated with uh, high-dose steroids. She settled out, and after five or six days in the third acute care hospital, she came to a second uh, rehab site here in Winnipeg. Um, she actually survived the pneumonia, but she was not doing too well in rehabilitation. Uh, she remained with very substantial cognitive and functional deficits. Um, and so we had a family conference to talk about future plans. Um, and at the time, um, I said, you know, she was lucky to survive the pneumonia. And her daughter said, well, no, no, she wasn't. Um, um, so after a fairly long uh, discharge planning process, 
The original plan was to go home with the stroke program follow-up, and actually she would have been followed by 14 specialists um, had the original discharge plan been put in place. Um, but throughout her rehab uh, stay, she kept dropping her blood pressure and, and having symptomatic CHF. So she was concomitantly in heart failure and uh, with the treatment of the heart failure was quite high, hypotensive. So she actually elected um, to to stop the, all of the aggressive care and went home on, a, on the palliative care program and actually just her family physician and the palliative care program um, as a follow-up. Um, so I thought this was sort of a, a good example of a fairly not an uncommon case, actually, of somebody with multimorbidities and what can happen uh, to people with multimorbidities while they're in the acute care uh, system. Um, and again, I think most people who work in clinical practice can think they've seen a fair number of people like this. Um, now, we think of multimorbidity as being kind of something new, and it very, is very important, so I don't want to underestimate the importance of multimorbidity, particularly in the modern era. But I think it's important to stress that the notion of multimorbidity is not at all new. Um, so it was well described in Byzantine texts on aging um, in the three to 400. Um, um, there's just some messages coming across with no audio. Do people have the audio? Um, so it was well described in Byzantine texts on aging in circa 300 AD uh, or AC after Common Era, and it was actually quite well described in, in many of these textbooks. And it was particularly noted um, um, that, that this was a function of aging. Um, and it's actually been noted in medical textbooks throughout the ages that multimorbidity occurs with aging. So it's not a particularly new phenomenon. It was actually well described in many of the clinical papers in the UK in the 1940s. And it is important now because it's getting uh, increasing attention. Um, and just to give one of the um, older citations, this was a paper in The Lancet. It was um, um, uh, one of Exon Smith's papers um, where they described one of the early geriatric units. Um, so what I'd like to point out here is the fact that two-thirds of the patient have multiple pathologic conditions. Um, and about a third of the people, only a third of the people, had acute illnesses, and another about a third of the people had acute illnesses in addition to, to long-term disorders. And the other key point is that the people with multiple interacting problems that were chronic in nature uh, tended to stay in hospital the longest. So, I mean, if you think of the current narrative in geriatric medicine, we tend to say that our hospital system was designed in a time when we had single system acute illness, um, and our system was set up to deal with that. But I wonder if that narrative is true, and I wonder if we set up our hospital system when we actually had multiple uh, pathological conditions at the time, and we just didn't set it up properly to recognize that, um, which has different policy implications, obviously, than, than, than saying uh, epidemiology has evolved rather than we set up the system perhaps incorrectly in the first place. Um, so I think it's important to point out that it's not new and it's actually been recognized for a very long time. Now another kind of classic paper um, was a, a, a survey of Scottish primary care clinics in 1964. So again this is before, both these were before I, I was born and again they talk about multiple disabilities but by disabilities they actually meant chronic illnesses. And, and men had slightly fewer uh, chronic illnesses than women, and I'll come back to it, but the average number of chronic illnesses was three, of which most were unknown to the family doctor. So <clears throat> again, the notion that as we get older we accrue diseases um, is not really a new notion. It's got a long history. Um, and there's also a long history of care models. So these are all uh, photographs or pictures of what used to be called hospitals for the uh, incurables. So this would be the British Home and Hospital for Incurables, um, entirely dependent on voluntary contributions. This is one in Paris, uh, a hospital for incurables. Uh, people from Montreal will recognize this one, and then uh, Amiens in France as well. So there are lots and lots of um, hospitals for what were called in people with incurable problems at the time. And these were care models for people largely with multiple interacting problems that were progressive and chronic in nature. So neither the notion of multimorbidity nor the care models are particularly novel. They're very important um, and worth looking at, but it's not really a novel idea. 
So when you come back to definitions, these are the definitions of the American Geriatric Society. Um, and again, these are based upon uh, Alvin Feinstein's definition. So first, when we talk about a chronic illness, this is a health problem that requires management over a period of years um, or decades. So I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, and then multimorbidity is the coexistence of multiple chronic uh, diseases and multiple conditions in the same individual. So this is where no one disease is the topic of interest. Um, or the topic of main focus. Rather, it's the whole sum of all of the issues that's important. And that's differentiated from comorbidity, where you have um, any additional entity that has existed or may occur during the clinical course of a patient who has the index disease under study. So this would be where you have a disease of interest and then you have the comorbidities. So an example would be heart failure with comorbidities of renal failure, uh, uh, macular degeneration, uh, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, but you're predominantly interested in the heart failure, um, not necessarily the whole spectrum of the diseases. So when you see the terms comorbidity and multimorbidity, those are the, the standard definitions. And the American Geriatric Society, the definitions we'll come back to, um, it is a bit variable. Some people tend to say more than greater than or equal to three chronic diseases. Some people put it as greater than or equal to two chronic diseases, and some people put it as greater than three chronic diseases. The EGS says gr greater than or equal to three chronic diseases. Um, and the second key point that's very important is that it's the accumulation of all of these diseases that's important. So it's the sum total of the diseases is more important than any particular disease in particular, and it's the cumulative effect of the buildup of all of these um, issues that becomes important. And the other point that the American Geriatric Society uh, makes is that multimorbidity is associated uh, with death, with disability, um, with adverse effects such as hospitalization. When people are hospitalized with multimorbidity, they're more likely to have complications of hospitalization. And it also predicts institutionalization, and it predicts uh, increased resource uh, use, and it uh, predicts a decreased quality of life. <clears throat> now, that being said, there's a fair bit of heterogeneity in people with multimorbidity. Um, so there's the same person is not the same person. So there's a fair bit of differences between people with multimorbidity. One is there are differences in disease severity. Um, so class 4 heart failure is obviously different than class 2 heart failure. Um, a creatinine, a very, very high creatinine is obviously different than a moderately high uh, creatinine. Um, so illness severity I is part of the heterogeneity. Um, another part of the heterogeneity is the functional status of the person, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, as well, there's a fair bit of heterogeneity in the prognosis of people with multimorbidity. Um, also, a fair bit of differences in the values that the person with multimorbidity has. So there's a huge variability in personal priorities, both in the person and their family, in terms of aggressiveness of, of treatment and, and other decisions like that. Um, and there's also quite a bit of heterogeneity in the risk of adverse events. Um, and again, the key point is that we need a flexible approach to care with multimorbidity. So we need to acknowledge the heterogeneity in people uh, with multimorbidity in terms of both their health status and also in terms of their preferences and goals and, and life experience. Um, so it's actually very important to have a flexible approach, not just between people, but also people may change over time. So it's important to make sure um, with people with um, multimorbidity that we follow them closely uh, over time. So I know I said it's not really a new idea that multimorbidity is there, but it is an extremely important notion. And I think one of the uses of the notion of multimorbidity is that we do need to acknowledge the importance of subspecialists, but also to re realize that we have to treat the person and not the disease, and the healthcare system needs to um, acknowledge that. And I think in acknowledging that, we do need to move away from uh, chronic disease management for people who have multiple chronic diseases and go to individual patient managed care, um, rather than just simply putting people on an assembly line for heart failure and renal failure and osteoporosis and macular degeneration and um, 
leukemia. We need to acknowledge that there's heterogeneity in the person and that we need to realize that there's trade-offs and balances between the different uh, systems and we need to move a bit away from the chronic disease management model if you've got eight or nine chronic diseases. The chronic disease model works very well, of course, for people with two or three, one or two or three diseases, but when you start getting up into extreme multimorbidity, you start getting into issues with the, the lady at the start where she's seeing 12 different people um, um, in, her, in, in the community. Um, the other important point is that prognostically, we need to consider uh, the cumulative effect of these morbidities as they build up. So it's you know, obviously not great to have heart failure, but it's a lot worse to have heart failure and renal failure, and it's a lot worse to have heart failure, renal failure, and osteoarthritis. And I think that's fairly obvious to most people, um, but we do need to make sure that we consider it in care planning. So that's sort of why it's important, even if it's not a new idea. Now that begs the next question, um, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but it is extremely important about how we measure multimorbidity. And there are a host of different multimorbidity tools, um, which we can talk about um, but we, if we have time. But the key point is that there's a host of tools, and the reason there's a host of tools is there's a host of different measurement issues. Um, the first issue is what's your data source? Um, so data sources can be very varied. Generally speaking, they can be administrative data. So this would be like a, a provincial claims data. Um, there are clinical data sets. So these would be like electronic medical records. Um, you can have self-reported diseases, um, particularly in epidemiologic surveys. And then you can have biomedical uh, um, measures as well. So measures of, for instance, your, your, your urocreatinine. Um, um, so you can have all of these different data sources. Sometimes you can use one or two or three different data sources, but most commonly one would choose just one. And immediately you can see some issues um, arising which will give different, uh, different uh, multimorbidity indices depending upon what your data source are. So administrative data tend to capture the whole population, but it does mean that the person has had to have had a contact with the healthcare system. Um, so they have to have seen a family physician um, or, or other primary care provider or have been admitted to hospital to be captured. And then the, it relies on the recording of the, um, of the clinician entering it into the billing claims data. So administrative data are often under report um, compared to the clinical data set and perhaps self-report. But immediately you can see that those different data sources have different uh, implications for measurement, which are extremely important. Um, so when you're looking at multimorbidity, the first question you should ask is where did the data come from? The second point is what's the time frame? Um, so a lot of them will use a period prevalence. So this would be the number of people with a condition in a given time frame. But of course, some diseases uh, vary. Um, so for instance, your cholesterol, if you're counting hypercholesterolemia um, as, a, as a disease in the multimorbidity index, cholesterol is variable over time, and at some points people can be dislipid, have uh, high cholesterol, and then it can normalize. Um, so if you use a period prevalence of high cholesterol over the course of a year, that's different than, than a single point, time in, uh, point in time. So that's actually quite important. <clears throat> the next important issue that comes is what conditions you include um, in, in the multimorbidity measure. Um, Often multimorbidities uh, measures contain risk factors, which technically aren't diseases, so osteoporosis and hypertension would be good examples. Um, they are adverse and they are a problem, but they're not a disease, they're a risk factor. So some multimorbidity indices exclude risk factors and some include them. Um, the other issue is whether you uh, count symptoms or somatic complaints. Um, so things like swollen ankles sometimes wind up in multimorbidity indices. Um, dent dentition problems that are self-reported sometimes wind up in multimorbidity indices as well. And that, that, that can uh, alter the, um, the, the, the index as well, or the measure of multimorbidity. The issue of double counting often comes up as well. So um, if you have heart failure, most people who have heart failure also have ischemic heart disease and also have hypertension and other risk factors. So you can run into the issue of some diseases being heavily counted, 
Um, in particular, vascular diseases can be heavily counted compared to some of the other diseases because you're actually counting the risk factor and the disease. And then the other issue is if you don't measure it, you don't count it. Um, so there are important conditions that may not um, be measured in a multimorbidity index. Um, in particular, rare diseases often don't show up in, in multimorbidity indices um, just because they're not um, highly prevalent. Um, then the next issue is whether you account for disease severity. So um, obviously there are differences in disease severity that are important. Um, and then the last question that I'll come back to is really should we be di dichotomizing the measure? Um, so we want to say this person has multimorbidity and this person doesn't, but most of the studies show that it's actually the total count that matters and should we be um, using the total tally of diseases rather than cutting it and saying these people have multimorbidity and these people don't, but rather treating it as a continuous measure because having eight uh, comorbid conditions is different than having seven, which in turn is different than having uh, six and five. So that becomes a question. Um, both the American and the British Geriatric Society um, have suggested dichotomizing it, but I wonder if that's in fact a great idea. Um, now, the other key point is that some of the, depending how you define frailty, of course, and, and that's a whole other talk that we, we I, I won't go into, but um, there is a, a clear overlap between people with frailty, people with disability, and people with multimorbidity. Um, so there are people who are both frail and have multimorbidity, particularly if you use some of the American definitions of frailty, um, and, and disability and comorbidity overlap fairly substantially as well. Um, so there is a fair bit of symptom overlap when you look at clinical surveys that, that is important. Um, now when you look, this is the data from Olga Thu, um, from, 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 from Halifax. Um, there is some overlap, but most people with the frailty phenotype actually have disability and comorbidity as well, and very few are just frail. So while there is some theoretical overlap, if we just go back to the previous slide, <clears throat> it's not quite like this diagram shows, and it's more like this diagram shows that most people who are who are the frailty phenotype um, have have a significant overlap with disability and comorbidity. Now, when you think about how people get to to multimorbidity, this is just a cut and pasted from a review. Um, in JAMDA. Um, so underlying the whole process is, is the aging process and the physiologic changes that occur with aging. Um, so we're, as we go through life, we're exposed to behaviors and then we're exposed to risk factors and then we acquire diseases, diseases which are first subclinical. So we have loss of reserve in, in multiple organs. So loss of reserve as we acquire low-grade diseases in multiple systems, which then progresses on to multimorbidity. And then you see the, the, the adverse effects of multimorbidity. So the notion is that slowly, steadily, over, we go, as we go through life, we um, acquire behaviors, then risk factors, then subclinical disease, then overt clinical diseases in multiple domains, and then we have adverse consequences of that. So it's important when you see somebody to think of how they got there over the course of their life, and a life course approach becomes actually quite important, both at an individual and a policy level. So one of the quite prominent papers from 2011, uh, 12 rather, um, was a paper looking at administrative data from Scotland, looking at essentially the descriptive epidemiology of multimorbidity in Scotland. And again, it's not a new idea, but this was quite a nice paper that does just a global description of the, how multimorbidity progresses with, with age. So this is just how old the person is and the percentage of people um, in, in, this, in, in, in a large Scottish data set. Um, and again, the key point, coming back to my point about what multimorbidity is and how we dichotomize it, is as we get into our 80s, the vast majority of people actually have multimorbidity. Um, so that does raise the question of, um, of how we define multimorbidity.
Um, and it also, the key, other key point is that it's very common in late life. Um, the other thing that they did was they looked at the, how the conditions interrelate with one another um, and how many people have multimorbidity if they have heart failure and the number of chronic conditions um, that people have with the individual index case. So this would be coming back to the notion of comorbidities. So people with heart failure, most people with heart failure have uh, important comorbidities. Most people with stroke have important comorbidities. Conversely, most people with asthma do not have a lot of multimorbidities. So it's important to think of how diseases cluster together and also how they interact with one another um, when, when we're starting to think about multimorbidity. Um, because different disease clusters may cluster together and those different clusters may be important. Um, and then the other thing that, again, I don't think came as any surprise, except for the magnitude of the effect, which is quite quite striking, um, is they looked at the this person's social positions or, or their socioeconomic status um, in relation to the development of multimorbidities and age. Um, and as you can see, if you're in the, in, in the lower deciles, um, you're much more likely to multimorbidity than if you're in the higher deciles of income. Um, this was by the region of, uh, of residence. Um, but nevertheless, it's not a bad surrogate for individual uh, social position, um, and you can see that there's actually quite a quite a quite a strong difference, particularly in midlife, and importantly, and we'll come back to it. It does tend to attenuate in, in late life a little bit. So this was data from all of Scotland, um, and this is the similar data looking at uh, the association with mental health and with physical health. Um, by social position, and the effect is consistent across social positions. So this is another study from the UK. Um, this is uh, Carol Brain's uh, study, the CFAS study. And again, as we get older, it's actually it's a bit of a complicated slide, but it's actually quite nice. And that the key point is that most people go into 65 with a chronic health problem, but most people are functionally intact and cognitively intact at 65. So most of us enter our, 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 our golden years um, with a chronic illness, but functionally intact. As we get older, um, and once we get into our 85 years, mo you know, most people actually are still functionally intact, but the rates of ADL impairment go up fairly substantially, um, particularly in, in, in women. Um, so this goes along with the earlier notion that as we go through life, we acquire health problems and then those lead to late life disability over, over the course of the life. So that's sort of the prevalence. There's actually relatively few studies on the incidence of, of multimorbidity. Um, so this was another British study just looking at the incidence of multimorbidity. And again, the key point I'd like to make here is that it's highly age dependent. So this incidence is the number of new people um, that, that acquire the condition, so the number of new people with multimorbidity. And again, it, it's highly, highly, highly age dependent. And those of you who are kind of like actuarial sciences, it's starting to look like a, a Gompertz curve where it just start, starts taking off quite substantially um, with age, not, not linearly. Um, so the incidence does seem to, well, it is very highly age dependent. And these are data from the CDC. Um, <laughs> uh, catch it while it lasts, I guess. Um, um, and again, it, there's a very strong age effect. Um, so as we get older, we're much more likely to have uh, multimorbidity. Um, but there's also a very strong uh, effect of social position. Um, so this is the percentage of people below the poverty line, and you can see that it's a fairly strong, strong, uh, strong effect of social position. And again, interestingly, it does attenuate in late life. And again, if you look at what common diseases are, this is one of Linda Freed's papers. Um, the common disease combinations, um, one is arthritis and visual impairment, one is visual impairment and high blood pressure, 
a third common uh, combo is arthritis and high blood pressure. Um, so the generally speaking, common things tend to accumulate commonly with each other. So it's not too surprising that these these do um, these do tend to run together. Um, the other thing that this paper found, which is actually quite important, is they found that there are a fair number of interactions and uh, between some of these different uh, diseases. Um, so in particular, things like COPD interacted with a lot of the other things to produce more disability than some of the other conditions. So they did start to look for interactions, although that does get a little bit complicated. So again, there's a, a, a set number of papers now, quite a few of them coming out showing all of the following. One is uh, an increased rate of death, uh, a reduced quality of life, a reduced functional status, and a higher risk of institutionalization and hospitalization as well. So I'm just going to, I guess, be a bit uh, parochial and talk about some of the Manitoba data now. Um, so this is the data from the Manitoba follow-up study of airmen. Um, and Bob Tate in the gerontologist, and what they did is they they looked at six common illnesses um, and just looked at the number of common illnesses. They did not find any interactions, and they found that if you have no chronic illnesses, um, the survival was obviously quite a bit better than if you had one chronic illness, uh, which was better than two chronic illnesses, which was better than having three or more chronic illnesses. And interestingly, they did not find any, any interactions, um, but they did find a strong cumulative effect. Um, and again, those of us who are in clinical practice will note that drug trials often have to change the, change the, the um, axis of the, of the survival curves and blow them up to show a difference. With most of these, you don't need to do any messing around with the axis of the survival curve. The effect is very large. Um, so I think this is just a, it's fine to discover cures, but remember chronic conditions are bread and butter. So we looked at this in the Manitoba Study of Health and Aging. So the Manitoba Study of Health and Aging was done in conjunction with the uh, Canadian Study of Health and Aging. Um, so this was data from the uh, mid-90s, 1990s. And what we did is we just did a simple disease tally. And again, this was not just diseases. This included risk factors and a few subjective complaints, um, like swollen ankles um, and joint pain. Um, and we just did a simple tally. So there were a possible 16 conditions. Um, and we just tallied them up. Um, and the people with the lower tally, so people with no chronic illnesses, had a very good survival rate. People with seven or more uh, chronic illnesses had, had uh, a less good survival rate. Um, and as I, I don't think it's any particular sur surprise, but again, it's a fairly strong effect. However, the effect of functional status was much stronger. Um, so this was just the Older American Resource Survey, the ORS scale of functional status, which can be um, categorized as good functional status, mild impairment, or moderate to severe impairment. And again, functional status, I don't think it comes as any surprise to people, um, but it is a very strong predictor of, of poor outcome. And actually, it's much stronger than the effect of, of multimorbidity. So it's actually, I think, important to keep in mind uh, that, that, that as well. So when you look at the Cox regression model, this is the, uh, for predicting a hazard ratio of dying over the, the uh, five-year time interval. Um, so this goes from 0 to 16. So each additional comorbidity uh, increases your risk by about 10%. Just in layman's terms, so the the hazard ratio of of mortality is about one one point one um, for each additional condition, um, and that holds true when you adjust for age, gender, and education, um, and age, gender, and other factors, um, including the MMSC and depressive symptoms. Um, interesting though, though, once you put functional status in the model, um, multimorbidity is not uh, predictive of dying in in this data set. So what we thought was going on was that as we go uh, very much consistent with the earlier idea, 
that as we go through life, we acquire multiple chronic conditions which progress, and then we acquire disability, and the disablement is, is the step um, on, on, to, on to dying, which would, I think, be consistent with these data. Um, so it's not that multimorbidity doesn't predict dying, it's, it's probably moderated through the functional status. Um, there's another couple of interesting things here. One is that um, uh, cognition remains a very strong predictor of dying independent of, of the effect of functional status and comorbidity. So we do need to consider um, uh, people's cognition in, 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 in prognostication. Um, so these are data we haven't published, but have just submitted to CAG um, coming up. And this goes back to the notion of what happens with functional status um, um, and multimorbidity. So this is the question was, does, does multimorbidity predict functional decline? And this is the Older American Resource Survey. And this is kept as a continuous variable. And this is just the number of health problems from like, 0 to 16, but there weren't a lot of people with more than 10. And you can see, in effect, um, at time one and then time two, five years later, that even five years later, multimorbidity predicts disability five years later. Um, and then this shows up a lot better, actually, when you look at the categories of functional impairment. So this comes back to excellent um, functional status, mild impairment, and moderate uh, to severe impairment. And this is just cross-sectional at time one, so people with multimorbidity. So this is the number of health problems that they have and this is their functional status, and you can see quite a strong effect um, in, in the cross-sectional analyses um, of multimorbidity on functional status. Um, again, not particularly surprising. What is quite surprising is even five years later, there's a very strong effect. So this is the number of problems at time one, um, and the more problems at time one, um, and again, this is just a simple disease tally. It's nothing fancy-schmancy. Um, um, you can see that this goes up fairly substantially um, oh, five years later um, by the number of comorbid problems. And I'm getting a message, can't see your pointer. Um, um, so um, I guess I'll, you'll have to think of it in your, <laughs> in your mind. Um, I'm trying to point out here what's happening. Um, now, one of the issues is that what happens is as people, just to be blunt, die, um, they get taken out of the pool, um, so that may influence the prospective findings. Um, so if you account for death, you still see a very strong effect uh, on functional status um, over, over time. So that's sort of the background of things that we did, and here's what we're now doing. And bear in mind, these are very preliminary data, so there's nothing final. It remains fairly early analyses. One is to describe the prevalence of multimorbidity in Canada. Two is to determine if there are gradients across social position. Um, and I won't talk about disease clustering, but it is something we've been interested in. So we've been looking at prospective uh, data from wave one, just in a cross-sectional way. Um, and we were using the tracking cohort. Um, so we are only using the data from the tracking cohort, which is intended to be as representative as possible um, uh, of the Canadian population. And we've restricted the analyses to 45 to 85. There are a couple of people um, in the data set who are 44, and there's actually a handful of people who are over 85 just because of the sampling frame. Um, but we're sticking to the 45 to 85 group. Um, we're looking at about 20-odd 20, 20 thousand people. Um, we used, we excluded people with any missing data on any of the um, multimorbidity uh, items. So we're looking at age, uh, gender, and social position. Um, so in social position, uh, we used education, individual income, and household income. I won't talk about it, but we've also been quite interested just because of Betty Havens in Manitoba in, in income source. That was one of her areas of interest was the income source um, as a predictor of outcome. So we have been looking at that a little bit. Um, the other fascinating point, having worked with the Manitoba Study of Health and Aging, where the median education was nine years, um, it's quite dramatically different um, in the CLSA than it was in the CSHA and MSHA. 
So the educational attainment of older people has gone up quite dramatically in the last 20 uh, odd years, um, as probably certainly in Manitoba, the one-room school rooms um, 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 had had quite a strong effect as they came into being. So when we look at Again, I, came, I talked about the importance of how you measure multimorbidity, and we chose a fairly straightforward measure. Um, we simply looked at the list of conditions. We chose ones that were f physical health, so we did exclude the mental health ones, and that's just because one of my areas of interest is looking at the effect of physical health on, on, on depression um, and other mental health issues. So that's an arbitrary decision we chose just the physical health ones we also arbitrarily chose to include risk factors so we did include osteoporosis and hypertension um, and that was done intentionally as well i think certainly from a clinical standpoint it's important because the treatments of hypertension um, sorry the treatments of osteoarthritis can worsen hypertension so we were interested in the interactions in those areas so we did include uh, risk factors uh, as well as diseases and then we also um, included the, the ones that are chronic in nature. And these are all self-reported by phone. So these are the phone interviews. And at the time we put in the submission, the, the, the uh, clinical cohort was not available. So what did we include? We included osteoarthritis. This was osteoarthritis of any joint. We included RA, other arthritis, back problems, osteoporosis, TIA, peripheral vascular disease, stroke. Again, we were double counting a little bit because TI and stroke are essentially different severities of the same disease. Um, similarly, MI, um, angina, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, asthma, uh, renal problems, hyperhypothyroid, um, and so on. So the, the key point is that the common things are common, and it's no surprise osteoarthritis is common, back problems are common, uh, hypertension is very common, and cataracts are common, as are migraines. So all we did was simply created a tally of these, and that was arbitrary, but any disease of multimorb any measure of multimorbidity is going to be a bit arbitrary, and we simply tallied them up. Um, then we took this tally, and then we looked at the cohort, and we standardized against the Canadian population of 2011, which was the closest um, uh, census data that are available. The CLSA is between the 2006 and 2011 um, censuses, so we chose the, the 2011 uh, uh, population pyramid of Canada, and we just did direct standardization to find out what the mean number of conditions was for the Canadian population between 45 to 85. And we came, when you do that, it's actually really quite creepy um, because it came out very, very, very close to the the one from Scotland in 1964, um, which was kind of uh, uh, interesting. Um, so I think this does beg the question, if we're using a cut point of two to three for multimorbidity, that's essentially a median split. Um, so it's it does beg the question of whether or not that's the right number to dichotomize at if we're going to dichotomize. That, that's becomes an interesting question. So the second thing we looked at was age, gender, and multimorbidity. And again, if you think back to the graph in Scotland um, from the Lancet paper, it's actually quite jarringly similar as well, actually, um, from 2012. Um, so this is the mean number of chronic conditions. And again, it's quite linearly related, um, at least up to the age of 85, with age. Um, and again, women have about a half um, uh, about, about, about a half more of a morbidity um, than men. A lot of that is osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. When you look at dichotomizing it, we chose three or more conditions, just because otherwise everybody would... would <laughs> if we went with two or more, um, everybody would have it. Um, um, so you can see, again, quite a strong age effect. And again, it's not surprising, but it's very impressive. So the next thing that we were interested in is looking at income. And this is the the, the total income of the person, um, which is measured by self-report. Um, and you can see quite a strong effect 
um, of, of income on multimorbidity. So we have um, the mean number of conditions, and it rises obviously with age, but people in the low income bracket are much more likely to have multimorbidity than people in the high income bracket. And the other important point to make is that we actually didn't have a lot of people um, in some of the cells um, who were over $150,000 a year in income. Um, so we did collapse 150 down to $100,000 a year in personal income. Um, but the two effects, one is the very strong effect of income on multimorbidity, um, which, which is quite, quite strong, um, and then that does attenuate with age. So it's much more apparent in younger people or middle-aged people, I guess, than it is in older people. And you see a very similar effect with household income. Um, it's a bit more variable um, in terms of the measure because there aren't as a lot of people with a very low household income. So it looks a little bit irregular, but it's a very, it is quite a strong effect. Um, and again, that effect does attenuate with age. So the other thing we looked at was gen gender income and multimorbidity. And this is the a percentage of people with three or more conditions uh, plotted against their personal income. And again, you can see quite a strong effect, quite a very strong effect. And the effect is actually somewhat stronger in, in women than in men. And again, with household income, a similar effect is observed, and there's a quite a strong effect. And again, it's not surprising, but it is a pretty big effect. And again, the effect is stronger in, in women than in men, a little bit. Um, where the gender issues become a bit bigger is actually looking at education um, and, and the effect. So the effect is across education is very strong in women and present in men, but a bit less strong. Um, so uh, highly educated women, you know, have you know, one and a half fewer comorbidities than, than people with a low educated women. And the effect is much, much less in men. Um, um, we can speculate why in the question session, I guess. Now, I'll say we need to interpret this with a bit of caution. These are the main effects models only. Um, and of course, when you have interactions um, with income, the main effects don't really mean much because it does depend upon age. Um, so these odds ratios should be interpreted with a bit of caution. Um, however, they're quite strong. They're not surprising in terms of being there, but I was quite taken aback by how strong the effect is. Um, and if you look, people in the low income um, bracket, so under $20,000 a year, are about you know have about twice as likely to have multimorbidity as those in in the in the high income bracket. Um, so that again, that's quite a strong effect adjusted for age and gender. Um, and again, the effect is quite consistent whether you use personal income or, or household income. Now again, when you look at the interaction terms, the effect is present in people over 65, but it's a lot weaker um, than, than under 65. And of course, the effect in people 45 to 65 is of course even stronger. Um, so when you look at the logistic regression for education, those who did not complete high school had about 1.3, uh, an odds of 1.4-ish of, of, uh, of, of having multimorbidity um, versus those um, who, who, who had some postgraduate education. So the effect of education is a little bit uh, uh, less than the effect of income. Um, and again, just to reiterate, there is a very strong interaction between age and income on multimorbidity, and the effect is attenuated in the older age groups. So in conclusion, we found that social position was quite a strong effect, uh, and it was a gradient effect, so it's not just very low income people, it was a gradient across the income spectrum, going from high to low, um, and it was again quite a strong effect. So our interpretation of just the social position things. One is the measure of social position is a little bit problematic in late life. Um, when people retire, they obviously change their income status, um, and that, that can have effects. Secondly, there's issues around gender and pension that are quite strong um, in this, particularly in the older age group now. Um, and then the last 
issue that becomes problematic in measuring somebody's social position in late life is their income versus their wealth. So the, just the very measurement of social position is complicated, as is, as I mentioned, the measure of multimorbidity is also complicated. Um, the second issue is that when in life do social position matter? And I guess the question comes back to this notion of a life course, and it's probably consistent across the whole life course. And certain people have um, a higher allostatic load, as the social epidemiologists would call it, of uh, marching through time um, in a lower social position is different than marching through time at a higher social position. Another complication, of course, is the fact that we're dealing with survivors. So um, if people in low social position are more likely to die, um, and that differentially affects the people with multimorbidity who are young, um, there'll be survivor effects in late life. Um, and then the last complicating uh, factor is there's also cohort period and age effects of wealth and education that have um, that are very, very, very difficult to disentangle. Um, except without large prospective cohort studies like the CLSA, but that won't we we won't know that until uh, you know 15 or 20 years down the line what the age effect period effects and cohort effects on wealth and education are, and then the last thing that we can't really measure is the notion of societal inequality. Um, so we're talking about their individual income, but we also have to think about the um, inequality of the society they're living in, which may have effects as well. So that was sort of our thinking, and bear in mind, again, these are quite preliminary uh, results. Um, so some of the limitations to our, 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 our findings, one is our definition of multimorbidity. Again, it was, like most measures of multimorbidity, a little bit arbitrary in a simple disease tally. Um, we arbitrarily decided to exclude mental health and, risk fa and include risk factors, um, and also exclude, uh, I think understandably, actually, acute illness. Um, nevertheless, I think this is very consistent, actually creepily consistent with the paper from Scotland, um, as well as a host of other papers which demonstrate an effect of social position. And again, the fact that there's a lot of research doesn't negate the importance of this type of research, but it does say it's quite, quite consistent um, and, and quite important. Um, so the other conclusions, I think, one, um, my own view is that we shouldn't be talking about multimorbidity as present or absent. We should probably be talking about um, a, a multimorbidity index or multimorbidity score um, because it does seem to behave much more as a, a linear variable than a, than a dichotomous one. So you're missing a lot of information by simply arbitrarily doing a cut point. Um, and related to that, if you do choose a cut point, you wind up choosing a cut point that essentially labels all older people as having multimorbidity, um, which raises questions of what normal aging is. Um, um, so my own view is we should think about it as a continuous variable rather than a dichotomous one. Um, um, and, and we can discuss that a bit if people want. Um, so the implications, um, one is at a clinical level for clinicians like myself, um, we need to review how we look after people, um, and I think we do need to individualize care. Uh, we obviously need to be aware of guidelines and, and disease management, but we have to also be cognizant of when to, to, to ignore the guidelines. Um, we have to be very cognizant of drug interactions, both drug disease interactions and uh, and drug-drug interactions, and again, a classic one would be hypertension and osteoarthritis. You give non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for osteoarthritis and you worsen hypertension or worsen heart failure or worsen renal failure. So it becomes very important to consider drug disease interactions. Um, it also becomes important in prognostication for screening um, and aggressiveness of care decisions. We do need to consider how many diseases a person has when we start treating one very aggressively. But related to that, we actually do need to consider functional status and cognitive status and disease severity in, in that prognostication because multimorbidity alone um, doesn't capture some of the quite rich um, prognostic uh, information in functional status and cognitive status. So I'll end with my personal thoughts. Um, I, I don't think, you know, people have been trying to get the ideal measure of multimorbidity, and I, I actually think that's 
quite difficult because of all of the measurement issues. Um, so I think we do have to choose a multimorbidity measure and recognize the limitations of the measure we're using. Um, and in particular, we need to consider the data at hand. Now, that makes it very difficult to compare prevalence and multimorbidity across uh, jurisdictions and across different studies. Um, so it does make uh, replicability quite difficult um, because each data set will have a different multimorbidity measure. Um, so I think we do need to recognize that as a, as a limitation. Um, and we need to be, related to that, we need to be very explicit about what our measure is. So we need to say what our measure included and what the, what the what how we measured these diseases. So is it by self-report, um, is on a telephone interview as we have, or is it by uh, a clinical data set, or is it by biomedical data? Um, and those will yield very different uh, findings. Um, that said, I think the really fascinating thing is just really how similar our, 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 our findings are to actually both the Scottish study of 1964 in primary health clinics um, as well as to the 2012. So I was quite struck by how uh, quite, quite creepily uh, consistent a lot of these um, a lot of these multimorbidity studies are, particularly around age, which I don't think comes as any surprise, and social position. Um, um, so that was sort of my, my final thought, is that it does seem to be quite, um, um, quite consistent across time and place. Um, so anyway, I thought that was my final thoughts. And then I came up with, oh, Megan's doing the next one. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. St. John, for your excellent presentation. I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, can you hear me now? Am I back yep. online? I can hear you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and have a short uh, question and answer session now. Rem uh, remember that you can qu uh, type your questions into the, um, into the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Um, so one question is, could some of the attenuation with income be because of the dichotomization, the three or more conditions? Uh, it's possible that the low income group has, you know, lots of conditions, five or six conditions, and the high income group has, you know, just two or three. Do you, you know, you you, you said during the the talk that you were maybe kind of dive into that that education and income uh, yeah. attenuation a little bit more. <clears throat> yeah, so um, it, it, no matter how, even if you mod model it as a, so just for the people without who are listening, you can just do a simple disease tally and count it from 0 to 31, which would be ours, um, or you can dichotomize it and say multimorbidity is three or more or, or two or more, wherever you decide to put the cut point. So we actually, um, my own preference was to leave it as a continuous variable. Um, and actually, you see the interaction term even if you use it as a continuous variable. Um, one of the yeah. one, so so it's no matter how you slice up the data, there is a f you, you do attenuate late life. Um, e even just the raw disease count does seem to 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 the social effect does seem to narrow even if you use it as a continuous measure. Um, the problem if you treat it as a dichotomous measure is it's so common um, in, in the older age group that you start uh, getting to, as you mentioned, methodologic problems of not having enough people in some of the cells, actually, um, uh, particularly sort of low-income people without multimorbidity in late life are unusual. Um, so my own preference is to leave it as a continuous variable, even though it's less commonly done. And we do see a strong interaction term um, even with leaving it as a continuous variable. So does that answer the question? That makes sense, yeah. yeah. So we have a question from Dr. Manishkar in Toronto. Mm -hmm. What are the features of evaluating a multimorbidity index, especially with regards to its predictive power? As well, how do we incorporate the synergistic interactive effects of comorbidities? You might have like addressed that during some of the the further talks, but do you want to Right. So there that? are yeah, I guess I can try, and my my answer is predicated with what I think I, I, I you know I don't think we'll ever have a perfect measure of multimorbidity, um, and we certainly won't have one that will be able to be used in all settings at all times, because um, if you look at 
particularly using administrative data, um, um, you are relying upon um, capture one of primary care contacts. Um, so people with multimorbidity may well not be seeking care. Um, so they'll just count as zero. Um, um, then that's different than if you survey, uh, which is, of course, different if you m measure survey and bio biomedical data. Um, so the ideal one would be to incorporate all of the above. So administrative data and clinical data and self-reported data and biomedical data. And the ideal one would measure interactions. Um, but the ideal is the enemy of the of, of the possible, I guess. And I so um, my own feeling is that you need to choose a multimorbidity index based upon the data that you have available, um, and then just acknowledge that that's a big limitation. Um, um, uh, so we're actually running out of time, so I'm going to pick pick one okay. more from this good list of questions. Yep. But um, so. Can you talk to kind of the changes in morbidity in the last 50 years and yeah, have medical I don't... advances changed kind of the... the <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading it now. The landscape of morbidity? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, clearly health has gotten better in the last 50 years. I, I think that, 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 that that's... The, so, so I think part of it might have been measurement issues across time. Um, um, and, and and two, Scotland is generally speaking a less healthy place than than, than Canada. Um, um, so I, I don't want to sound like nothing's changed and we're not progressing because things things are progressing. Some of the different tally might be because people are getting healthier, but we've invented new diseases. So for instance, osteoporosis was not in like the, it just didn't exist as a as a as a measurable disease. So one of the most common diseases just wouldn't have been captured so wouldn't have been counted in the, that three three diseases in the in the Scottish paper from 1964 um similarly hypertension has changed as well um so um there will be a lot more people now with hypertension because we've lowered the bar for diagnosing it compared to 1964 um so i don't want to sound like nothing's changed and nothing's gotten better health has gotten better um the and, and two, we still need this research because I think we still have structured care to deal with single system disease, and we still have structured um, individual care to deal with single system disease rather than multi system disease. So I, I don't want to say that nothing has gotten better because things have gotten better, nor do I want to say that research isn't important because it's all been done before because it has. I think rather the, the message I'd like to have is that this is very important. Um, but it's not novel. This type of research builds upon uh, a previous uh, uh, history and, uh, and needs to be considered in that context um, rather than as something novel and new. Because um, we have this preoccupation with novelty and innovation um, rather than kind of slow, steady progress, which I think is a little bit uh, misleading. Um, so I think there has been slow, steady progress on multimorbidity, both clinically and in research, but it's been slow, steady progress, not some kind of major, major uh, uh, innovation. And Does also just the aging society brings these, these, these issues to the forefront. Right, right. I think that's a, common. another good well, point. Well, thank you very much, Dr. St. John. It was an excellent okay. presentation, and we'll yep. just run out of time for the questions. So, okay. Um, I'd like to thank you, and I'd also like to tell everybody that our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, June 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Dr. Megan O'Connell from the University of Saskatchewan will be speaking on factorial invariance of the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, or CESD. Please register and join us for next month's webinar. Registrations will begin um, for the next uh, webinar soon. I'd also like to remind everyone that CLS. CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is on June 12, 2017. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, further information, and details about the application process to gain access to the data sets. Um, thank you again, everybody, and particularly uh, thank you very much again, Dr. St. John. Thank you.